chemistry team. It's your chemistry coach coming at you for a new chapter and a new concept this time. So this is video number one for acid and bases. So a lot of this is going to start out as review uh, for my class uh, for Chem 185, second semester general chemistry. This is going to be chapter 16. Um, so let's review a little bit and look at three different models uh, for viewing acids and bases, and, and each one has their particular advantages and disadvantages, uh, depending on what type of chemistry class you're in. They're preferred one way or the other. We've got the Arrhenius concept, which you probably should have covered in introductory chemistry and first semester general chemistries, but we'll review it in a second. Bronsted-Lowry model, which is the main one that we will be using, um, and that should be review for you, and we'll go through it real quick. And then the Lewis concept is probably a new one for general chemistry, and this is more used for organic chemistry. Uh, and I'll briefly touch on it, but it's not something we're going to focus on too much. So let's start with the Arrhenius concept. All right, guys, ready for model number one, review the Arrhenius concept of acids and bases. Guess who put this one together? You're right, somebody named... Arrhenius! <laughs> Responde Arrhenius. You're going to see that name pop up all over the place. Um, so the way Svante Arrhenius pictured acids versus bases is what they produced if you put it in water to make a solution, like an acid solution or a base solution. So acids produce, a lot of people use like introductory chemistry, H plus aqueous, um, the hydrogen ion, whereas uh, more in general chemistry, it's better to use the hydronium ion in solution, whereas bases produce the hydroxide ion in solution. You're prototypical when you see that, you go, oh, you think base, and here you think acid. We're trained to do that. So let's do a couple uh, equations that show you that real quick. All right, so let's take something like uh, hydrochloric acid. So we've got some HCl acid there. Let's say that ionizes in water. And that's a strong acid, so that's not going to be reversible. We're just going to, that's going to drive all the way to products here. And that is going to react to produce the hydronium ion plus the chloride ion. Easy peasy. Nothing new there for you guys, right? But the way Sponte Arrhenius looked at this and went, hey, there's something that produces hydronium ion in solution, so that must be an acid. I think acids are pretty easy to recognize. You see those, they have the hydrogen that it can that can create the hydronium ion by donating it to water. Not the best model to look at acids and bases. It's very limiting. Right? What if you're doing reactions outside a solution? Ah, this model doesn't work too well, so that's why we have the other ones. Um, bases now, less obvious. Now, obviously, if you see something that has OH- minus in it, for example, you know, sodium hydroxide. Most people look at that and go, hey, there's a base right there. Because you can see the OH minus. But there's some species that don't have OH minus in it, but it produces OH minus in solution, right? So this is an ionic compound, so that's not going to react with the water. It's just going to break apart. It's going to dissociate. So that, and it's strong, so that's going to do it to 100% where we get the sodium ion and the hydroxide ion, right? So here we've got something producing the hydroxide ion. Therefore, that must be a base. Very simple concept, all right? You're going to see a lot of overlap with this with the Bronsted-Lowry. So let's look at that one now. All right, team, for the Bronsted-Lowry model, if you remember from your prior classes, acids are defined as anything that's a proton donor, or H+, right? Uh, bases are the opposite of that, proton acceptors, or you can think of them as takers, because sometimes an acid, especially if it's really strong, will just shove its proton onto a base, whether the base wants it or not. So the base is an acceptor. You can think of it that way. But if you have a strong base, boom, it's going to be grabbing H pluses from different acids, whether the acid wants to give it to it or not. And those bases, you can think of more of as, as proton takers. So whether you think of a base as an acceptor or a taker doesn't really matter. I like to switch them up when I'm talking about the strength. A, a weak base is more of a proton acceptor. doesn't really want it necessarily. Uh, whereas a strong base is a taker. It's like, hey, poof, poof, give me your lunch money. I'm taking your H plus. Right? So let's do an example of each. as a quick little review of what you had before. So let's take a weak acid this time. Let's take hydrofluoric acid. 
Remember to, to uh, memorize your, your six strong acids. That's going to be important, right? Your HCl, your HBr, your HI, your HClO4, your H2SO4, and your HNO3. Those are the six that you want to remember for your strong acids. Most everything else is going to be weak acid. So you can look at tables for that. All right, so if I have some uh, hydrofluoric acid, in water, of course, this is my acid. That's going to be donating an H+, plus, because they're H plus donors. So that's going to be donating a proton over. Right on? So we're going to have a reversible reaction because it's a weak acid. It's going to go both directions. We are going to form. The water picks up an H+, plus, so we're going to get the hydronium ion exactly like we did before for the Arrhenius concept, right? So Arrhenius concept says anything that forms hydronium is an acid. Well, this has the same idea. So Arrhenius would look at this too and go, oh, well, that would make it an acid, right? And then I'm going to get what's left. So I cover up the hydrogen, and I'm left with the fluoride ion. And of course, this will be reversible. So in the reverse direction, that's acting as your acid. That's acting as your base, right? So whatever you have as an acid, the other thing will be as a base, right? Because it's accepting protons. You can look at it both ways. So that'll be your acid. This will be your base. Um, we're going we're gonna to have to, because this will be an acid, this will be a base in the other direction. But in another video, we're going to have to notate those a little different. We're going to use these terms called conjugate acids and conjugate bases. But that's for a later video. Let's take a look at bases. Less obvious, I think, for bases because you don't always see the OH minus in it. So let's take um, methylamine, for example. We've run into this species before. I don't see an OH in there, so it's not intuitively obvious from the Arrhenius concept that that's going to produce OH minus in solution. But let's put that in some water. This is going to be a weak base, so it's actually going to go both directions and form an equilibrium. What will happen here is that's a proton acceptor. So what's going to happen, it's going to take an H plus from the water. So in this case, the water's donating. We can now classify this as our base because it's accepting. And then this would be our acid. Kind of weird. In this case, water's acting as a base because it's accepting the H+, plus, says Bronsted-Lowry model. And here the water's donating it, so it's acting as a Bronsted-Lowry acid. Whoa, there's going to be a term for that in a later video, if species can be acids and bases. Hmm. They're pretty special. All right. What am I going to get? If this gains an H+, plus, I'm going to, and it's the nitrogen that's going to, and you're going to see this in the Lewis model as well, uh, a little bit, where we can see things a little bit better. But the nitrogen has a lone pair on it, so it's going to be, that's where the H plus is going to dock in. So we're going to get the CH3, right? Carbon can only have four bonds. NH3, and that'll pick up a positive charge there. You're picking up a hydrogen and a positive charge on that nitrogen. Uh, and in the next model, we'll look at where the lone pairs are. And then the, the water loses one, so it becomes OH and it loses a positive charge, so it becomes OH minus. You get the hydroxide ion. So Savanti Arrhenius would look at this and go, oh, that qualifies as an Arrhenius base, right? This does, because it forms OH minus, but not really obvious like the sodium hydroxide example. But you can see how powerful the Bronsted-Lowry model is for identifying acids and bases. And this is what we predominantly use in general chemistry, right? So let's take a look at the last one, the Lewis model, which is more organic, but hopefully you can see the overlap between these. All right, team, our last concept number three, the Lewis model or concept. Gosh, I wonder who developed this one. Mm -hmm. I'll let you think about that one, <laughs> right? Chemists have a, have a, a habit of naming things after themselves. So in this scenario, acids are lone pair electron acceptors and bases are lone pair electron donors. A little bit different way of looking at this. And again, maybe you can see some overlap with uh, the uh, Bronsted-Lowry model in, in a second when I do some examples. But a, bron uh, a, a Lewis base will have an atom in it that has a lone pair of electrons on it. And then the Lewis acid has an atom on there that really would like to attach to that lone pair, 
right? And that creates what's called a coordinate covalent bond. It's just a single bond, like a covalent bond. They're sharing the electrons. But in this case, all the electrons in the bond are coming from one species. So it's, it's like you and your friend going out to lunch, but you, you pay for the whole lunch. Yeah, you're sharing, but not really. All right, so all the electrons in that covalent bond come from the Lewis base. Boom, and, it form, and it's just a regular covalent bond. We call it a coordinate covalent bond because all the, the electrons in the bond came from one species. So let's take a look at an example here. Let's take an electron deficient species. It's things like boron and beryllium. So let's take a boron compound. Let's take boron trifluoride. Right, so let's do the Lewis structure for boron trifluoride. If you don't know how to do this, go review Lewis structures. But you'll see that boron is an electron deficient species, right? It only has six electrons. It wants eight, right? Eight's the magic number. And if we react this with ammonia, let me draw the Lewis structures for this, and hopefully you can see. And if you don't know why ammonia has that Lewis structure, I want you to go review Lewis structures. Hopefully you can see before I do this what's going to happen. You can see that this is lacking a pair of electrons. If it gets another pair, it gets eight electrons. It has six, but it wants eight. And it goes, oh, look at that. You have a lone pair. I would like to have your lone pair. And the nitrogen goes, I'll show you my lone pair. And so it's going to go boom, just like that. And that's going to form a coordinate covalent bond, just a regular single bond. But this is donating the lone pair. So this would classify as a Lewis base. It has a species with a lone pair. It's donating a lone pair. This is accepting it, so this would be my Lewis acid. Not too tough, right? Not, this would be tough to do with the Arrhenius concept and the Bron Bronson-Lowry concept. So if I do this reaction, we're just gonna pretty much just connect these like two Lego pieces together. So we're gonna have the boron trifluoride which really doesn't change too much. But so, oh, you gotta love these halogens, these terminal halogens with these three lone pairs. Uh, it takes forever to draw those. And then we form this coordinate covalent bond. And remember, I can use a line to represent two electrons. You can write them as electron dots, you can write them as lines, doesn't matter. And then the ammonia connected with that. And there's your resulting species, and that's called a coordinate covalent bond. We're going to see a lot of this in a later chapter when we get into what are called coordinate uh, covalent complexes or complex ions or co uh, coordinate compounds. Um, they're called coordinate compounds because they are made by coordinate covalent bonds, which is just a Lewis acid reacting with a Lewis base. That's going to be some crazy stuff later. Um, but here's your brief introduction to um, the three different models. And again, we're going to focus on the Bronsted-Lowry model, and we are going to have some more review in the next couple videos. There's a lot to acids and bases. We'll see you next for video number two. You guys rock!